Good evening. My name is Michelle Bartlett, for those of you I don't know, and this is a very exciting night. In this building that was in the works for how many years? Twelve. Twelve years. It happened. <laughs> it's open, and you are part of the first community event to happen here. So look around, and you, you all are kind of pioneers. You start, went on, with our gray hair, we are anyway, but, um, <laughs> but tonight we, we launch what we hope that this will continue to be, is to invite the community in, to be part of the learning process that we have at UAF. And learning process doesn't stop when you graduate. It keeps going and going and going. As we've seen, I see a lot of Ali members here. I wish your lifelong learning. If you're not a member, you should be a member. It's a wonderful organization. But you don't have to you know, be, have gray hair to continue to come to the university and enjoy it. So tonight is actually the fifth legacy lecture that we've had. And what, it, what was a legacy lecture? Well, six years ago, a woman by the name of Jean Kirsch, who graduated from here with a degree in biology and went on to Stanford to become not only a doctor but a psychiatrist. And, um, and uh, she's one of the two uh, Jungian analysts, the foremost Jungian analysts in the country. Wanted to come back and visit her alma mater. And she wanted to come and, and give a talk because she wanted to give back. And out of that, the idea came of why can't we as an institution invite people to come and that have not only graduated from here, but have made their mark in the world, not only within our community, within the state, within the national audience. So it started. I partnered with, uh, Summer Sessions partnered with the Alumni Association. What better organization to make this happen? So the, one of the reasons that it's free is because the Alumni Association each year gives us some money so that this can happen. The first year was Grace Scheibel. Grace Scheibel, when I called her and asked her about whether she'd be willing to do this, she said, it sounds a bit like self-aggrandizement to me. <laughs> and I said to her, well, what if we did it um, with Robert Hannon interviewing you? I said, and she said, and I said, Grace, you knew things, you saw things that nobody else was here, and we need to remember. We need to remember. So we did Grace. Second one was Neil Davis right here. Thank you, Neil. It was great. <laughs> Third one was Joe Usabelli Sr. Last year was Willie Hensley. One of the things that happened that we learn, we get smarter as along the way. And when Joe Usabelli uh, Seniors was done, they brought in a film crew. And they filmed it, and it turned it into a documentary that KUAC has had. So subsequently, we brought Neil back. We brought uh, Grace back to redo theirs. Last year we did Willie, and tonight one of the reasons that filming is here is not only are we going to have it available and putting it on the web, but we're going to be turning it into a documentary. So you'll be seeing it on KUAC in time to come. Okay. So I can't thank the Alumni Association enough. I can't thank my buddy Robert Hannon enough, and he's going to tell you why we chose Vera. So let's give both of them a big hand. Well, it's such an honor to be asked to do this because I, I, I think I'm just like anybody else curious. And a remarkable thing is an uh, institution like this has generated remarkable people. And uh, it gives me a chance to talk with them, to celebrate them, and find out about their lives. And as I was preparing for tonight's um, discussion, it occurred to me uh, there isn't a headline in a paper here locally, across the state, across the world, that doesn't have an article that in some way links back to Dr. Vera Alexander. If you want to talk about the fisheries of Bristol Bay, you want to talk about shipping across the Northwest Passage, the health and diversity of species in biomes across the oceans in the world. Tonight's guest, Dr. Vera Alexander, has either researched in those areas or she's been instrumental in, in uh, directing policies and committees and programs that impact each of those areas. It's a remarkable achievement. But as you'll find out tonight, she's a woman of many facets. 
She and her family were refugees from the growing menace of Hitler. She's a groundbreaking scientist, as I mentioned, an administrator, a guiding hand at the formation of international policies, uh, policies and programs. And as you got a chance, perhaps, to see, if you watch that heroin uh, uh, voyage revisited tape, she's also an accomplished pianist who loves Chopin. Now, before we begin our discussion, I just want to highlight a couple of particulars about her uh, past. She's, of course, a dean and professor emerita, and she's a recognized authority in the biological, oceanography, and marine sciences. Uh, when UAF School of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences was formed, she's the person who helped get that going and then helmed it for 20 years. Recently, she's had the opportunity to crack a bottle of champagne across the prow of a new marine science vessel, the Sekuliak, and again, instrumental in shepherding that through. And you've heard of Moby Dick. Pursuing that vessel sounds a lot like Ahab going after <laughs> the whale. So uh, before we begin this little bit of business, please silence your cell phones. And then welcome Dr. Bill and Vera Alexander. I think you're OK. <laughs> now, I'm always interested, um, when I talk to science, what their background, what their family was like. Was your family uh, oriented towards science? My family was oriented towards science in a, in a broad sense. My grandfather on my uh, father's side was a professor of uh, philosophy at the University of Budapest. Okay. And then his grandson became director of the Institute of Mathematics in the Institute of Budapest. So they were definitely on the scientific side. My father was a physicist, but he was a rather entrepreneurial physicist, if that's a good word. Yeah. He, he did not ever have a real job, as far as I know. I like that. Yes. And uh, he was very instrumental in developing high vacuum technique. He invented the Mercury phenomenon, glycerine diffusion pump, worked on high vacuums, found out how to put metals onto uh, materials at very high vacuum, and uh, uh, could have made a fortune in his career, not been unable to handle that part of the business. <laughs> so he sold out to an assorted mining company. And they, of course, made a fortune out of making uh, reflectors for radar and satellites and all that stuff. Now, your family originally was in Europe. It sounds like Eastern Europe? Uh, Budapest, Hungary, yes. And then, so uh, <coughs> as Hitler came to power and things darkened across the continent, it sounds like your family decided to uh, move to England. Is that right? As far as I know, that was the reason, although I think that was only part of the reason. My father was definitely an Anglophile. And he saw uh, opportunities in England. And so we moved towards them. And then actually, we stopped in uh, Belgium and Holland first. We have family in Holland as well. And we um, ended up in the north of England just about the time the war was uh, getting underway. But it was a good time to get out anyway. Oh, yeah, I would imagine so. Um, how did that work for your family? Did uh, Were they able to get um, their uh, assets out, or did it seem to have an impact? How did that piece work? I didn't really notice any impact. Okay. I mean, they were, uh, I don't think they had a whole lot of assets to start with. <laughs> and uh, it, they, they, were, they got along for a while. Well, going back to the intellectual, once you're back in England, you developed a love for music and Chopin. Did that come from the household? Was your family music loving? They loved music, but nobody played anything. <laughs> so I was, I was sort of the first, almost, in, in doing that. But I was very much encouraged. And, and uh, they, they made it possible for me to study piano, starting at a very early age. And they found out that I enjoyed it. Except I would never practice it on a tour around. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds so familiar somehow. But well, obviously, you, you still retain uh, a great ability and still love the music. Would you go to concerts with your parents? They loved primarily opera. And when it was possible to go to opera, whether it was in uh, Italy or in 
London, we would go. And I, I became really very, very fond of opera. I listened to opera a great deal of my time at home. Mm. Uh, other kind of music, they had recordings and they were able to get. I don't think we ever went to a kind of performance, though. So, about what age was it when your family relocated in, uh, to England? My age? I must have been about four. Oh, quite young. So, did you go through the English uh, prep school or um, they call it public school system? I did. <laughs> <laughs> and you survived. Yes. You know, I'm always interested that a guy like George Orwell and many English authors just had horrific um, experiences in the public school system, but they're all in boys' schools, of course. Did uh, I assume girls went to girls' public schools? Yes, that, that, that time they were definitely separated, but the girls' schools were also very strict, and there's a lot of regimentation, a lot of uh, Sort of uh, telling you how you're doing by disapproval rather than encouragement. That was a, and it worked in a way, and in a way it was comforting. I don't know why I say that, but, but it was. It wasn't all bad. Uh, for one thing, I was able to spend a lot of my time avoiding following the rules. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can't help it. Every novel I read, Tom Brown's school boy, you know, all the way through Harry Potter. People are always breaking rules, and that's part of the public school experience. One of the things they insisted that whenever we're out in public, and that was not public as countryside, that, that you wore a hat and gloves. And uh, I would never wear a hat and gloves. I would immediately shed these things as soon as I got out of the school, and then avoid being seen by the uh, people who were on bicycle monitoring the students to make sure they were complying. So they're out there patrolling. Uh, <laughs> It's pretty awful. Yeah. Um, oftentimes with refugees and uh, people who enter a country, they go kind of several ways, it seems to me. They either kind of grow withdrawn and, and become sort of insular, or they try to become more, in this case, maybe British than the British, or American than the Americans. How did that strike you and your family? Was there a tension there? Um, not really. Uh, my family didn't really go out of the way to change, and they never really spoke English fluently. But I made a point of becoming more English than English. Mm. Most definitely. Well, I can still detect an accent, I think. Yes. Yeah. It doesn't go away. <laughs> <laughs> well, and of course, during the war years, there must have been heightened tension. There was there any kind of uh, sense of ostracization or? Disapproval at all from the general um, people around you? Not really. And actually, at that time, we were enemy aliens in in Britain, and uh, we were not allowed to have a radio. We were not allowed to have cameras. But my father worked in the National Guard and helped with the defenses, and we took direct refugees from London in uh, to the country so that they were safer. And so they were. We were pretty well appreciated, even though there were certain rules, because of our nationality. The other gift that I think the English public school system tends to do is you learn quite early on how to formulate clearly positions, argue aggressively and robustly for them, and, and sort of have a give and take there. Did you learn that? Was that part of your upbringing too? I think so, most definitely. Well, now I have to, so you're in England, you go through the public school system, and somehow you 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 tap the University of Wisconsin. <laughs> so I don't know. Something about that strikes me as odd. How did that happen? Well, I think it was it must have been about 1950. Um, my father decided it was time to move to the United States, and I but but that time I'd been out of school for a couple of years. I, I actually dropped out when I was 16 and went to work on a farm. And so uh, that was just about the time that I was thinking of getting back to studies, and I was accepted at Cambridge. And then my family moved, moved to Princeton, New Jersey. And they said, well, do I want to uh, remain in England and go to Cambridge, or would I just come to the US? So I thought about it quite a bit. And then said, there should be some good universities in the United States, perhaps. But not on the East Coast. I want to be where there's farms and countryside. And, uh, 
southern and far north and west as I can go. And so I selected Wisconsin because it's number one, it had farms, and, and number two, it was far west and north in those days. It wouldn't be now, but it certainly felt that way in the 50s. And so that's where I went. Well, now you're a young girl. I gotta follow up on that one. Did you ever think to be a farmer? Yes, that's what I was going to be. Not because I understood what farming was really about, but because I like to be out mucking around in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> Playing with horses. And I didn't realize that Nancy bought a farm at that time. And I wouldn't have taken off very well. Well, and you still retain an affection. You own horses, you're a question, right? Yes. And so you, you retain that love. Um, and so let's then go to the United States and University of Wisconsin. Um, were you pretty sure you wanted to be a scientist at that point? I actually talked to the uh, person who was my advisor and said I wanted to uh, be in agriculture. And he was very wise. He said, you really need to get your sciences in order so you can be good at agriculture. So we're going to put you into chemistry and biology <laughs> and all these things that I was not thinking about in particular. And that's what they made me take for. And once I was in there, of course, I kept growing, rather than going into agriculture. Now, you say it's 1950. I always have this sense that following the war at universities across the nation, science is getting a huge influx because it's apparent through um, the explosion of the atomic uh, weapons in Japan that there's a great deal of power there, but also a general understanding that the United States has to really step up to the plate. What was it like studying science at that time? It was quite amazing. There was a lot of momentum. And, uh, and one of the things that uh, really encouraged me was the way the students got involved in what was going on with the scientific community at Wisconsin. And I also became really interested, apart from the, those more practical parts of science, in the conservation and the work that some of the conservationists did, especially Aldo Leopold had been doing. And I, I became, became a great admirer of some of the people in the biology faculty. Well, Aldo Leopold was, of course, great grandfather of, of much of our modern right. uh, movements. Well, you're moving then uh, from agriculture and eventually moved into zoology. Yes. And uh, talk about that transition and what kind of critters you were interested in. Well, the reason I ended up in zoology was like I came, became interested in water and uh, the lake program in zoology which was one of the uh, top U.S. programs in zoology at the time, was actually uh, embedded within the zoology department. So in order to work in that, I had to go into uh, zoology. And uh, I, I got uh, involved with a lot of graduate students at what was the Lake Laboratory. And as a, a fledgling undergraduate and all these great and mighty graduate students, I was impressed. And then they adopted me and let me go out and do my own measurements once a week and all this kind of thing. I was hooked. Yeah. <laughs> so and it, you haven't looked back since. Um, were there role models at that point of women researchers? Were you? Were there a lot of other women that were studying the scientists, uh, sciences at the same time with you? Um, at the undergraduate level, there were a few, but not so many. And in the, in the graduate level, none, eventually. And you begin your work in lakes. Now, around this time, you get married as well. Is that right? Yes. And was your husband a scientist? And yes. And so one of those graduate students. <laughs> <laughs> the glamorous ones. Um, well, now, and so he studied lakes. Yes. And guess who all was in that? Uh, convenient. Well, um, what was the focus of, of the research? Well, he was actually doing a PhD of, of dealing with uh, lake midges, but I was not interested in the lake midges. I was working more on phytoplankton. Ah. And so, um, and again, phytoplankton, pretty, pretty low on the, the ring of life. Absolutely. And it seems like you also study nutrient cycles. 
metals mm -hmm. of nitrogen, for example. Right. Again, a pretty basic uh, component in any biome. What drew you to those foundational elements? Why were you interested in these, just, you know, the kind of ground floor level of life? That's a hard question to answer because I just followed my own nose and got there. Because obviously it's really critical. I mean, without the first uh, producers, there can, can be no life. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And with nitrogen, I became really fascinated when I learned that all the nitrogen, most of the nitrogen in the atmosphere is not available, even though it's the most abundant gas, because of the double bond that can't be broken easily. And so there are organisms that can break it and, and make nitrogen available to the biological system. So I became, became quite fascinated with that problem. And it, and it became very important, but let's kind of move forward um, and come up to Alaska, but in the interim, so your husband gets his PhD. Did you get your uh, BS? Uh, yes. And so you've got your degrees. What happened? How did you make your way then to Alaska? It's almost so courteously. Um, <laughs> I got my master's degree in Wisconsin as well. Oh, you did? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, But after we left Wisconsin, we went to Bermuda and spent some time working at the Bermuda Biological Station and then went to Georgia to work on Sapporo Island. I went to the University of Kentucky, and I went to the University of Pittsburgh. <coughs> but you weren't, you weren't researchers, you were gypsies. Exactly. <laughs> well, we were, we were always looking for a better place. Yeah. And I, when I finally got to Alaska, I said, this is it. I am not moving. <laughs> well, uh, you're working on your master's degree while you're moving across the country. That's why right? I, I did a long distance. My major professor in Wisconsin. Okay. Um, and I understand you were quite an outdoors woman even at that time, or as you continued to be an outdoors woman. So you, you, your family, you're kind of being outdoors as well as in the lab and in the, the classroom. Yeah. That Has that always been important to you? Very important. Well, when I think about that, again, from your British uh, upbringing, there are great explorers. You know, you think of uh, Scott of the Antarctic, mm -hmm. and, uh, et cetera. Were they guiding you? Did they inspire you at all? Or did you just happen to love the outdoors and science at the same time? I guess I always loved the outdoors. In England, I spent most of my time out in the woods with, with my dog, just walking around looking at things, especially puddles of water. Did you have a microscope at that point? No, no. I didn't know I was interested. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you decided once you got to Alaska, you're not budging. Right. What was the campus like then? There was not. There was nothing up here in the West Bridge at all. Everything was on lower campus. There was a uh, physical institute was a web building on lower campus. Uh, we ended up in a small laboratory in. Uh, the Bernal building in the chemistry department, uh, there was really no space available. And then we ended up on one floor of the Guthrie building. But it was, there were a lot of buildings that aren't here anymore, and very different. But there's a lot of campus housing, a lot, a lot more than there is now, the playground uh, for kids right in the middle of it. And did the uh, International Geophysical year happened around that same time? It, just before then, a few years before. And the effect of that, I think, this is my interpretation, I mean, it may not be accurate, was that this university certainly realized what a gold mine they were sitting on and, and the opportunity to have major research activities because it was demonstrated by the geophysical research that it could be done here. And so they brought in a, uh, a person who knew how to set up these institutes and set up the they sort of made science and also the sort of Arctic biology shortly afterwards. And then that really started the research activity going on this campus. When you had an opportunity to start your own research here, uh, what did you, where did you originally work? <laughs> I don't know whether I want to confess this, but I was working on Smith Lake, <laughs> <laughs> the biggest ocean in the interior of Alaska. <laughs> 
And what what do and, and I understand the university tried to help your research, but didn't quite achieve their ends. It was so cooperative. Uh, I was working in winter, so we dragged a uh, hut out of the lake and made a hole in the bottom and a cracked door so I could be inside and not be quite as cold as it was through there. And then one of the people at physical part decided he was going to be really helpful. And he went out and plowed all the snow off the lake around my hut, which totally ruined my experiments. <laughs> well, did they fix it? Yes, he came back and tried to put it back. <laughs> I'm thinking you were a force of nature even then. <laughs> well, and then it strikes me too that you had become one of those glamorous grad students. Um, were you teaching at the same time? No, not while I was studying. But I only, uh, we arrived in 62 and I got my PhD in 65, so I wasn't a glamorous grad student for too long. No. But when then you became faculty and was teaching part of your. Um, yes. And how were you as a teacher? I think I was awful. <laughs> <laughs> the first course I gave was a graduate course in ballet philosophy. And uh, I didn't, uh, I thought, well, I need to tell them all about everything I know. And I started talking. And one student came up, came up to the, the end of the one hour and said, I have never taken 20 pages of notes in one lecture before. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, notice how they'll take the class from zero. That's right. Um, That's so, I think I've learned since then. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and now when you're studying at Smith Lake, you're studying nitrogen. Yes. And that was pretty important in groundbreaking, wasn't it? Yes, it was. So what we did was um, actually we were the first people to ever use nitrogen 15 heavy isotope in uh, natural systems, especially in water. It had been used in laboratories before, but never. For, and one of the reasons it had to be easy to use is the instruments were not available. And we actually had to uh, take our samples to a medical school, some of which had been run. So the <coughs> medicine that was really used. So we tried using, setting up a system for doing it. This was at the advice of my major professor back in uh, Wisconsin. And we managed to do it. And what we found was the most amazing thing. We, everyone just thought bacteria fixed nitrogen. And uh, it takes a lot of energy in organic attack, and it also takes anaerobic conditions. But what we found that was that most of the nitrogen fixation is in surface, well aerated water, carried out by um, Brugian algae, which we call now called cyanobacteria. And these use photosynthesis uh, in, in order to uh, get the energy to fix nitrogen. And this is true of lakes, it's true of some of the ocean, it's true in Arctic tundra and uh, barrel. That the lichens have the same species of algae in them, pseudobosses, and all of the surface is damp places. So the amount of nitrogen being brought in that this, this way exceeds the bacterial uh, input in many areas. So, really, groundbreaking and have vast applications. Yeah. Well, now, nowadays, uh, M15 is being used for all kinds of uh, reasons. And Part of the reason for that is that machines are so much better that you can actually determine very accurately and measure what, uh, what the content is of, of biological systems and you can figure out what they've been eating. There was no way we could do anything that sophisticated in those days. Mm. And it took a long time to process samples. Mm. You also started to expand your research areas past Smith Lake <laughs> and uh, you ended up going north, is that right? That's right. Yeah, talk about that. Well, I, I had two th things I did up north. First of all, we decided we wanted to do some work on, on the Beaufort Sea, the north near shore of Beaufort Sea, and find out how the systems there work as far as the algae uh, primary producers uh, went. And so we trained a couple of unfortunate graduate students in diving, <laughs> and took them up there and uh, had them dive uh, off the shore, off Barrow, uh, to go and look and see what was going on, do experiments, actually, on the side of the ice. And these poor people, they'd come up absolutely blue. There were no dry suits in those days. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes. I've often heard about the grad students are really the cannon fodder for <laughs> I didn't realize how true that was. Yeah. How many did you lose on that? Uh? Actually, it, 
make them tougher. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the people who don't go in who say that. And yeah. I, I know. I had to on the rope. <laughs> <laughs> Tug once if you can't make it up. Um, and then after that, was the International Biological Program started, and we uh, worked on tundra ponds in the Barrow area again. And then again, we did nitrogen and, and uh, primary producers and up to take of other forms of nitrogen as well, and also nitrogen fixation on tundra. So I was doing a lot of uh, that kind of work for uh, the three years of the IDP. And again, one of those kind of larger than university systems that it participates in, we may be jumping a gun, but I'm often fascinated about the relationships and the discussions that must take place with uh, professionals and academics in their discipline around the world, let's say. What's the value of, we talked about the geophysical year, about this um, other international effort. What, what value do those um, programs bring, do you think, to science? It seems to me that international cooperation has a number of facets. One of them, of course, in the oceans is very clear. There is no such thing as a boundary between uh, countries as far as the oceans are concerned. It's totally artificial. And one of the, I'm jumping the gun now too, uh, one of the reasons we formed the North Pacific Marine Science Organization, PISEED, for the Six Nation Treaty around the Pacific Ocean, was because you couldn't study the Pacific Ocean Basin unless you took the uh, all sides into account. So it took cooperation to do that. And it's, with the IBP, International Biological Program, we learned a lot by comparing how the tundra behaved in Barrow, in Sweden, in Norway, in Finland, even in Canada. I'm saying even in Canada, but it doesn't help. I'm not going to say. <laughs> Strike it from the record. Uh, well, and of course, there. then you're, you're doing this research at the Cold War time. So there's a huge section of the North that we're not even talking about, which is the former Soviet Union right. and Russia. They were not involved. Yeah. And so that seems like a huge area to kind of leave out. So, um, uh, but it also sounds like a, a time of great excitement and great um, ideas must have been generated then, insights and programs for new research that must have trickled down here to the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Yeah, I think it trickled all over, actually. <laughs> I mean, uh, so the universities far south of here were involved in the, the Arctic and, and getting a lot out of it and giving a lot to it as well. Uh, one of the big organizations that is involved with it or was involved with it was the Marine Biological Laboratory at Woods Hole. And, uh, sure. and since then, they, Run the, the long term ecological research site at Tulick Lake. So. Well, I'm not going to jump too far ahead, but since we will talk about the Sequoia, what was the research vessel you had when you originally started, and how seaworthy was that? Well, first of all, we didn't have a research vessel when we first came up, came up here, and then we were able to acquire from Oregon State University a Kona. Uh, which was a very small vessel that rolled, and it was terrible. <laughs> but we tried to make it better. We cut, we took two and then from this, thinking that might be better. Four and four, you, you cut the boat in half? Yes. And <laughs> added I don't remember how much we added, maybe 10 feet in the middle of it. <laughs> <laughs> and it didn't help. Not that much. <laughs> and did a leak or no? At least. Yeah. And it was reliable. And it usually turned the right way up. <laughs> <laughs> but it rolled. Well, you always had those grad students to put it right, didn't you? <laughs> um, well, okay. So when did you acquire the Alpha Helix then? And was that an improvement? Oh, yes. It was, it was an ocean liner compared to the Acona. <laughs> One time in Seward, we had the uh, a corner in the dock, and Alpha Helix was up here doing some other work. She was owned by Scripps at the time, 
when she pulled up alongside the captain and I told him, if I ever get a ship like this, I'll be so happy. <laughs> Looking at the uh, Alpha Helix. <laughs> and a few years later, indeed we did. And uh, it was a, it took a little finagling uh, because the, the system in the US is, is you just sort of get a vessel. You have to sort of go through all kinds of shenanigans with, with the politics. Oh, we'll hear about those, I'm sure. Yeah, and then uh, the National Science Foundation decided we did need a better ship. The uh, academic fleet people, uh, our colleagues, uh, said they want process. No, they want process. No end runs. <laughs> <laughs> it got to the point where one day I was in a, uh, I was at Harvard some some meeting where at the at the hotel and the head of the fleet. Uh, management, uh, like it, you know, was sitting there and, uh, and he said, you think you're getting the Alphaeus, don't you? I said, yes, I think. Not over, over my dead body. <laughs> so I quickly ran to and called the director of the ship operations at National Science Foundation. Oh, he said, people are going to get, he said, don't listen to the cells. So, <laughs> <laughs> but it was a lot of work up to do that. People like Dolly Dieter, who was our ship operations head, and, and Tom Moyer, who was ship did he have worked hard to, to help them and get, make that transfer? And we actually went and, and uh, kidnapped of the Alphabet in Seattle, however, back from, from the, uh, I think, Borneo area. She never get, got back to scripts. I think, <laughs> I think that's called a press game, when they, uh, uh, So, what is life on board a research vessel? Give us a picture, at least. Um, if not the Akona, then the Alpha Helix. What was life for a researcher? Well, it's pretty, pretty hard work. Um, we usually operated with a six, hour, six hours on, six hours off regime. That meant you were sort of always low on sleep. Uh, you had to work even if it was barely possible to stand up. And uh, so you would hang on to bench with one hand and try to do something with the other, or you work out on deck and conditions are so exciting sometimes. So it, it's not very easy, but uh, it, it's, um, I, I sort of enjoyed it, and it was sort of sadistic, but what is that? Masochistic. Yeah. 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 I think what both would come into play, because yeah. I, any time I've been thrust in uh, a small group of people for an extended period of time in cramped conditions, I grow snarly and so does everybody else. Does any of that play a part in life on board? Uh, or is everybody pretty civilized? I think people are pretty civilized. Yeah. It, because you work on ships, a lot of room is around all the time. And usually the scientific complement of a ship is not very large. Um, on, I don't remember what the maximum was on, on the Alpheus, but it was probably about 15 scientists. So it wasn't really crowded. Sometimes you fight for time on, on the wires, the something and broken. Yeah, oh, yeah, I would imagine yeah. so. But there has to be a chief scientist who gets settles all these disputes. Oh. <laughs> so a lot of bribes and. Uh... <laughs> I don't know how you do it. Um, and I also think of a crew there. So how does the crew naturally interact with uh, with the scientists and researchers? Pretty well, is everybody? Yes, else? I think normally pretty well. Even on movie night? <laughs> oh, uh, I'm talking about Noah's ships. Oh. Yeah. 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 Tell, tell, I love that story where science takes a back seat. Well, when uh, when they started talking about uh, oil exploration <clears throat> offshore in Alaska. They started this so-called OXEP program, which is, well, I don't remember what it stands for now. But anyway, it's environmental studies in support of uh, future oil development. So I was asked to, uh, to take charge of the first cruise of, of a NOAA ship that was brought out of Wasp Falls to, to the Bering Sea uh, to do an assessment of the Southeast Bering Sea. And so this big ship, ship with lots of rules, and uh, what is it? Incident that I have not mentioned to you before is that they would, uh, they would have, we had stations at regular uh, points that every so hours we would stop and when we reached a certain point. Well, it, it was a meal time and the scientific personnel were sitting down to eat. 
which we had to do in the officers' mess, uh, uh, they had to keep eating, and they couldn't do the work. And if they got up to do the work, they would not get fed. <laughs> so it's a bit like master and commander, right? It's right, like exactly. It was O'Brien novel. And the other thing was that uh, at 8.30, promptly, we were told we had to vacate the lab because it was the only place that they could shoot and do this for the crew. <laughs> <laughs> so it didn't matter what kind of <laughs> research, you know, sorry, no, we got to show Gidget or something. Um, well, one of the things you just mentioned kind of suggests um, that you kind of have to work with administrators, and, and much of your uh, academic life has been leading programs and shepherding things through. Um, I, I want to talk a bit about that. How did you move from research into uh, administration and, and helping run programs? Just sort of happened. I'm not sure exactly how it happened. Well, knowing that instinct of yours. Yes. Is that, yeah. yeah it's a, I don't even remember exactly, except that um, certainly with the Institute of Marine Science, there was a clear vacancy at one point, and uh, they uh, didn't. A person came who didn't work out as director, and things were sort of in an uproar, and uh, so. It, yeah, they asked me to take it on for a while, at least, so I did. And I found I sort of liked it, but I tried to keep a lab going at the same time. I tried, to, I, I tried to have graduate students. They got neglected, and it didn't really you know, work. there to hold the rope with their <laughs> <laughs> So I slowly let my laboratory go and then didn't accept any more students. And uh, I was really blessed because I was with a such good help. I had mentioned this before, both in the lab and the former students, and also techs and assistants. I had such good help, and also as director and later dean, I did not realize until I was no longer in those positions how spoiled I was. Mm. Everything was taken care of. Mm. I, I had less work to do than I have now when I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, but it, it strikes me that um, the quality of your work, and you obviously must have uh, demonstrated an ability to lead and to guide and kind of have that big picture. With your research um, up in Barrow and then in the Bering Sea, um, what were some of the things that your work and others uncovered? It must have been a time of great expansion. And that kind of expansion must have created opportunities that you later filled, or I guess we, in biology, call them niches, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what was some of the research that you were taking care of or working on? Well, the thing I was working on mostly in the marine area, uh, in the Bering Sea and also in the Antarctic, was the role of ice in uh, supporting biological systems, especially at, at the lower levels. And uh, it turned out again, just as it, in the uh, National Fixing Algae, that we hit a jackpot in that we found that the uh, ice was absolutely critical for the high productivity of the Bering Sea, uh, as we know it. We don't know what would happen when it goes away, but, but the system is now really depends on an early spring, which is generated by melting ice. And uh, I don't know whether I should go into the technical details. <laughs> what happens when the ice melts is you have to get a layer of almost fresh water on the surface. And that is very stable because it will not mix with the denser water below. And that means that the plants, which are already in the ice, are released and bloom, bloom in huge numbers and produce something way ahead of the real growing season. Yeah, um, and I want to want because where I'm kind of going, I think, is of course with uh, disappearing sea ice and um, global climate change. Those areas that you were working in are now incredibly important in understanding what the changing world might be like. And was there any prescience at that time that this indeed was 
going to have global ramifications? I don't think so. I was, but I don't. I must have had some sort of inkling of this because I remember giving a talk at the National Zoo of all places in Washington D.C. in which I was describing what would happen to the marine ecosystem in the Arctic if uh, warming continued. This was maybe 1980 or something like that, and I was mentioning the potential plight of the polar bears, and uh, that was way before we were really thinking about these things. Yeah. And also in our Bering Sea work, we uh, 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 some of our work spanned the years of the big regime shift that happened, which was demonstrated by a sudden reduction in ice from one year to the next, to one reduction that did not go back. And let's talk about regime shift. What, what do we mean when we talk about regime shift? It means that conditions change in some direction uh, so extremely that they got, cannot revert. Mm. In other words, a permanent change. And we've seen that, yeah. is that right? Well, we've probably seen two, uh, although the second one is not as clear as that first one. That first one was 1976-77. And what flipped at that point? What changed that? the regime won't go back to a previous state of nature. Is that too technical? Is it? Yeah. Figure out how to say that. Well, I mean, I, I guess I, I see the headlines. I look at, at how important fisheries are, how certain species are disappearing, and the chain effect that that um, is causing. And I have to think, if ever we need research, if ever we need researchers from different parts of the globe working together, sharing information, it's got to be now. Mm -hmm. And you were there at the ground floor again, not just nitrogen fixation, but this whole system science approach in tackling big environmental problems or issues and developments. And so in some ways, your experience then must have been just as groundbreaking as you move into kind of shaping the uh, way research at UAF goes, helping form national policies and committees and guiding where they're going to go. So it's in a tremendously important and exciting field, but I, I, oftentimes I don't know if people recognize it at the time, that you know, there's gonna be a regime shift, you know? Yeah. And so, uh, <coughs> is there any idea when you're more talking to your colleagues then, that you're kind of getting closer and closer to this, after the regime shift is identified, that you really will now have to study a new kind of game. Does that make sense? Am I simplifying it too much for you? I think it's, um, it's not really a new kind of game. It's, it's figuring out how the system is actually working uh, under the present conditions, how, it, how variable it is. Um, I don't really know quite how to explain that. Well, that's pretty, I, I, yeah, obviously I'm a, a lay person and not too uh, uh, knowledgeable about it, but I'm really fascinated about it. And, and as an administrator, are you guiding things like that? Well, let me even grow more specific then, and maybe we can come back to it. Because when the university decides to go for a fisheries and marine science program, they tapped you to do it. So again, you must have, how did that process come about? Let's talk about that and maybe jump back to it. How did, how did you get tapped to form a new school? For, uh, I don't know how many years, there, there were studies after studies of how fisheries should be handled at the uh, University of Alaska. And volumes were written about it. And uh, consultants came, recommended this, that, and the other. And no solution was seen. Uh, but finally, the board meetings decided it is really time to have everything marine under one umbrella, a navigable scan. Uh, one of the reasons was no duplication. I don't think you can avoid some duplication. That's not really the issue. But the issue was to make a functional system in which oceans and fisheries were together. And so we had the, we had the materials to do it both in human resource and in uh, facilities, almost. Uh, in Juneau, we had a really outstanding group of faculty that were working under the 
campus there. And uh, they were really good, but they came into school kicking and screaming <laughs> because they were, they were nine months employees teaching undergraduates. No PhD program. And on the other hand, they really sound people in Fairbanks kicking and screaming because they don't just blow down fishery people involved with them. And so my job really was uh, to try to fit these people all working together. I sort of described it in, in uh, the, uh, uh, when I wrote an application essay as being like a symphony conductor. All these brilliant people know how they play their own instruments. You've got to make them play together somehow. <laughs> That was, it took some time, but the first thing we did, we worked on was the, the uh, Juno situation and uh, worked uh, with the faculty there to get a PhD program approved and get them working with, with more research grants. And they did beautifully, absolutely beautifully. As I say, they, they were really first rate. And we've got other units to start you know, on the stage also. And so we just created the school in this way with the great challenge of distance and communication and different uh, backgrounds and histories. And so I think all the time that I was the dean, I don't think the school was had yet matured to the point where it was functioning as a really unified school, but it was getting there. I think since then, the, the dean since then had been able to uh, pull it together more and make it function more like a, a true academic fisheries unit. I was more interested in the research side, so I emphasized bringing that together, but I was not as good as on the academics. Well, you always have to lay the foundation. Uh, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and uh, at the time, you know, when I mentioned that we had uh, a school of marine science here, I, I, everybody looks at me and says, well, now Fairbanks is landlocked. Now, why, how does that work? I had this question with the Board of Regents so many times. I said, to study the solar physics, you have to live on the sun. <laughs> <laughs> or I can get to the Beaufort Sea, the Gulf of Alaska, and the Bering Sea at exactly the same time. So I don't have to go from some remote coastal region to reach the other areas in that point. But then thirdly, we are not beachcombers. <laughs> and usually that does it. Right? Yes, <laughs> that's right. Um, so now, talking about the administrative work and, and relationship, um, you've had an, and played an important role on international programs, panels, and organizations. And um, one of them, for example, uh, you continue to serve as a U.S. delegate of North Pacific Marine Science Organization. And you've taught in various uh, places around the world. UAF is a prestige research institution. How does that international component play when you're studying things like marine science? And what are your observations been as you've gone around the world? Do you have, I mean, getting uh, academics and fishery people to talk is one kind of, I, I would think, a sort of a diplomatic uh, ability. Getting scientists from other institutions and other countries to work collaboratively together or play a role. I think scientists, but on the international scale, generally, generally want to play together. And they, they welcome it. Certainly, I mean, Pisces has worked really well, even though there's certain difficulties because of governmental problems with some of the nations. But China uh, often has to uh, take a firm line on things, and is not all, always able to negotiate. And uh, Japan won't let us advise on any fisheries matters and things like that. So there's a there's political. Uh, problems, but scientifically there are none. People work together really well. Mm -hmm. But um, oftentimes, I would guess, uh, on these uh, programs, trying to convince lawmakers or policymakers of the importance, making that next step, and you've had to play a role in that way too, presenting the material. 
presenting the data. Mm -hmm. That must be tremendously challenging. Is that right? I don't think so. That's probably that, that difficult. Um, and are they generally responsive? Do they get it? I think so. Oh, well, good. Yeah. <laughs> so we can, oh, no worries then. No worries. I think we're going to well, one of the things when we were talking earlier um, uh, to prepare for this, I asked you what was the most sort of uh, rewarding uh, program you've been associated with, and you talked about the census. Yes. Talk about that. Well, what is the census, and, and what drove it? The Census of Mean Life was a 10-year research program that was uh, generated uh, by the Sloan Foundation. And it was uh, the idea of, of the census was to simultaneously find out what lives in the ocean, all, all the world's ocean, what did live in the past and what will live in the future. Holy smokes. And this is a big interesting thing. By the time it was done, there were uh, 55 nations involved in it. And uh, all because of very small amounts of slow foundation money that was. Uh, given uh, with great discretion and selection. And it was run by 11-person uh, International Scientific Committee, of, of which I was one, one member. And we decided what projects would be supported. And then uh, Slowbird had funded those things that would make the project successful. They didn't usually fund the whole science. They funded uh, the uh, development of proposals, uh, they found in management offices and, and uh, synthesis uh, uh, activities and provided a synthesis group and uh, outreach group at the University of Rhode Island that was absolutely professional in this. And I think those structures that supported the science enabled the generation of amazing amounts of money from other agencies from all, of, all around the world. Sometimes Sloan did have to support the research too with to be really important and there was no funds available. So that in the end, we had all this amazing work, a lot of it pioneering. Uh, up here in Alaska, we had uh, two major programs. One was the Arctic program that was extremely successful, and then also part of the coastal program, which that was run out of Japan, but we, uh, we had a management office for the US here. And that was a really a, a great program as well. But both of these had support from some foundation for the office, for some travel, uh, to bring some Russians in, and uh, so on and so forth. And uh, both were actually a uh, part of international efforts. And so I think there's a uh, spending of money not requiring a hypothesis, doing real. Uh, sleuth like research, find out what actually is there, mm -hmm. uh, made it possible. Uh, every day during the hydrogen, we had new species reported. Wow. I'm amazing. I think uh, we have expanded the number of known species in the oceans about at least twice, if not more. Wow. And it found that uh, life in areas that were thought to be barren, the really deep ocean, or, or in the most amazing uh, situation. So it was, I thought, I think it was just absolutely thrilling. Uh, oh, I'll bet. Yeah. And, and with someone with your background, it must have been so exciting. And that program manager, uh, Jesse Osterbaum from, from Rockefeller University, was, was absolutely brilliant in, in, uh, uh, in guiding us scientific steering committee people to do the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, well, I'd like to learn how that works. Um, well, at the same time, oh, talking about a 10-year program, uh, we heard how long it took to get this auditorium and the building in which it you know, sits uh, built. How long did it take to get the Sequoiac realized? And I want to hear how some of the, the backdoor works uh, <laughs> seeing a vision realized get realized. So can you talk a little bit about that? That was a really a, a long, long odyssey. It started by Bob Elsner, actually. Mm -hmm. He was at Scripps and got uh, made friends with the, the uh, 
we as an architect in Seattle who are uh, not only uh, 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 the designers of the Scripps Act, but they also were the designers of the Alpha Helix, and you see with the scripts. And so Bob Elster got to uh, familiar with them, it, uh, met them when they were down there working on some scripts vessels, and then um, stayed in touch. And he got the idea that we really needed an Arctic research vessel. And uh, I wrote a proposal, got it funded by the National Science Foundation, and started designing. I got involved in that at that point in working on the design. I still talk about where I believe and some others. And we actually got completed the design, and uh, it never got built. <laughs> it just fell back. So we started another design, and uh, that was funded by the National Science Foundation. And we got that completed. We, all the way to model tests, but there was no money, and they said the ship had grown way too large. It was much smaller than the Zucurek, but it was too large. <laughs> and and uh, we had some new ice breaking uh, uh, technology uh, from Finland that we wanted to adopt, and the Coast Guard said, no, that was not going to work. <laughs> and of course, the Finland's no better than the Coast Guard. So anyway, uh, that went by the wayside. We started the next design. And it was the school react design. And uh, it was hopeless. There was, there was so little support in DC. But the, the, but the National Science Foundation had become a little, little more interested. And what that time, the director was Rita Caldwell. And I, I was in DC, and she came to me and said, Don't worry, you'll get your ship. <laughs> Again, so easy for somebody else. But, but it came to pass. Yes, but not when she was there. <laughs> but it did happen. And it was sort of lucky that there was funds. What was the name of the program? Uh, Brad, what was the name of the program? ARRA. No. Yeah. Was it a, a different Rick program? Rick yeah, Recovery Act. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. That, that, oh. Because the design was ready and, uh, and, uh, they needed uh, ready projects for the, the money that we got supported. And so from the National Recovery Act, you got yeah. funds to, yeah. to realize it. Was it exciting when you hit the champagne on the prow? <laughs> it was a beautiful day, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> it was horrible weather. I mean, wind and rain. I was really sorry for the crowd. And, People who were sitting there watching. I mean, there were some 2,000 people out there just soaked. And uh, yeah, well, I'll have to confess, I couldn't hold on to the bottle the first time my hands were so cold. Well, we always have a backup, I understand. And that one was successful. <laughs> well, we're running uh, out of time here, but I want to ask you both on the census and on the Sekuliak. These are programs that will pay off years down the line. What are some of the issues that you hope your colleagues, or do you have a crystal ball prognostication um, to leave us with this evening? <laughs> crystal ball. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's... Hey, well, if that administrator said, don't worry, you're going to get your shit, you can say anything. <laughs> I think I think uh, the census has demonstrated there are, that there are ways to get research done effectively, uh, and that really what you have to do is make it possible and stay out of the way, because that's one of the things that that uh, I noticed from that project was that the, the scientists were absolutely free to pursue their own way of doing things, as long as it was working. And uh, the managers of programs only stepped in if they needed help. And otherwise, they stayed out of the way and did everything possible to, to give support and encouragement. And uh, so scientists involved did not have to do their own public relations. It was all done for them. The word got out. They, they, uh, I think it was just important <coughs> to run things in that way in order to really get something done, as opposed to trying to say, you, you're 
going to do this research, you're going to have this data product on this day. I think that is a very important way to do things, and it's getting to be more and more the trend now. Well, it must have worked because you've achieved so much, and, and it's such a great honor to be able to talk with you this evening. So, thank you so much. And we're going to open up now um, questions from the audience. And uh, because I have the microphone and I have the power, um, if you'll do it, I'll repeat the questions so other audience members can hear. So does anybody have a question for Vera? Oh, come on. Some of you are scientists. You've got to have questions. I see a hand tentatively coming up there. Yeah. You talked about the melting sea ice and the importance of productivity. Could you talk a little bit about um, climate change and ocean acidification and the relationship with your um, landmark research or where things are today with that topic? So you're asking about uh, the her ice uh, research and, and the changing situation today and acidification? Yeah, well, of course, certainly acidification wasn't an issue when I was an active researcher, so I'm really not in a position to say more about that, except that the ocean is definitely getting more acidic because of the CO2 that's being absorbed. And, uh, it's, and I think that's probably one of the most critical issues in, uh, in uh, the ocean scientists today is how to control this, because uh, it's going to have incredible effects on the biological systems if the organisms can no longer form cells because of calcium to carbonate their solution. Yeah. So it is a major problem. It's being studied, I think. Um, I'm not involved again, but uh, there is, a, as I said, a center of excellence in studying this here at UAF, and uh, hopefully some progress will be made. Mm -hmm. But definitely, uh, there's going to be problems with coral reefs, as well as uh, other uh, invertebrate populations uh, because of this issue. It's uh, not related to the ice issue, except that in cold water, it's more serious than if you do warm. Anyone else? Have a question? Yeah. Quite enough that Vera was the first woman to get a PhD at this university, and she can talk a little bit about what it was like as a woman scientist at a time when women weren't doing that as much, especially up in Vera. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a good question. Yes, this was a real problem when it came to uh, working. Women did not go on ships. One thing's bad luck. <laughs> and uh, and. Uh, in Barrow, uh, most definitely they didn't get to go to the ice islands, they didn't get to. In fact, during the IDP, I tell you, we actually we were put in that concert hut off, off site so it wouldn't be a problem. Uh, you know. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So, that, because there were quite a few women, women involved with that. But in the oceans, there were no women that were working at that time. We had, I had one colleague here, Rita Horner, and she and I worked together on the boat at sea. She got to go to the ice out in C3, and what the director of the uh, uh, Barrow Labs told her was, you can go, but no other way. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, the situation for women today, there seems more uh, women have entered science and are making a uh, uh, mark in science. Yes. How do you see that playing out? Is the future rosy that way? or? Is there, a, uh, do we need to get more women involved in science? I think that, that it's pretty open now. One of the uh, issues now, of course, is that you don't have to go to sea as much as you have to. They can, there's nothing that, even on submarines, women can go now. There is no exclusion at all. But if you, if you don't feel like going to sea or what, they have other interests, you can do remote sensing, uh, you can uh, do uh, modeling, or you can actually control sampling on a ship sitting on the shore. There's systems. Oh, brilliant! I like that. <laughs> we have systems where uh, you can't tell whether you're up on the ship in the control room or you're ashore because you're working by telecommunication, and you're, it's just so you're on the ship. You send this uh, remote uh, 
vehicles down to the bottom, and as you see something interesting, and you push the controls sitting in the laboratory and say, take a sample, it takes a sample. They're not on the ship at all. Yeah, They've technology got, must have changed tremendously. Yeah, there's one such center in Rhode Island, and they're creating one at uh, Washington, University of Washington. It's amazing. Yeah. They call it the Inner Space Center. <laughs> so there isn't a glass ceiling in a base? Not really, no. Okay. And let's say, say the, the range of what you can do in, in ocean research is expanding tremendously. Great question. So what was it like two things about working with Dr. Wood? And then the other thing is, how many people had PhDs before you? Because it was extraordinary many at UAS. There were, there were, I don't know how many men that had PhDs before you. There were no women, I know that. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I'm sure they were. Well, the only uh, PhD granting unit there was the Geophysical Institute at that time. And uh, they were probably uh, a handful at that time. Um, it must have been, yes. I don't think we had a formal program yet. Yeah. I don't know whether geophysics was, was it? It's going to be a real a, a PhD program. Right. Yeah. So what about working with Dr. Wood? Did, how did you encounter him? <laughs> <laughs> the question working with Dr. Wood. I, I, I never had a problem working with Dr. Wood. He was quite a gentleman, really. Totally a gentleman. He had his own ideas, and it was a certainly a. What does that mean? It, was, <laughs> it means that you couldn't change his mind on certain things, <laughs> and therefore some people certainly had problems with him. But um, I never did. So, and uh, I didn't work as much with him as with uh, Peter Ray, who was the vice president for research. He was also my major professor. It was a good choice, actually. Because, he, because he, he wasn't around. <laughs> <laughs> it was part of that, getting out of the way so they can go. Well, Dr. Vera Alexander, thank you so much for your work, your legacy, and spending time with us this evening. Thank you so much.